please pop them into the chat as well. And we'll kind of get started. So today we are going to be focusing on doing our best um, to create inclusive, um, oops, I, I have the chat open over my thing so I can't see it now. <laughs> one second. Uh, I got to close it down. Ah, technical issues, one second. Ah, one sec, sorry. Okay, we got to close this and go to this. Oh, technology. Anyways, um, so we're going to, how about doing your part in creating inclusive workplaces and communities? And so I'll just start off talking a little bit. I mean, thanks, Amrita, for having me, but then also the introduction. Um, I do want to say that we are in Vancouver, the unceded territories of Musqueam, um, Squamish, and the Slave Tooth. And, you know, as we're honoring the ancestors when we're on these lands, it's really important to think about, you know, as we're looking at how do we move forward, um, it's super important to um, remember where we came from as well. And that's where how our cultures influence us, um, but then also how, you know, other people's cultures might be influencing them as well. And so when we're speaking today, we're going to be doing, um, looking a lot around yourself as an individual and looking at self-awareness um, and who you are. But then how does that kind of actually translate on the, to the external as well? And if you have questions, please, as I mentioned, pop them into the chat. I'll do my best to answer them as they come up. And Amrita, if you can help me answer any questions as they come up, because sometimes with screen sharing, it doesn't always show up right away. And, um, and I will just kind of start. So one of the things is like over the last couple of months, um, the anti-racism movement obviously has influenced all of us in some way or the other. Uh, we've been impacted by it. Uh, some people energetically have been feeling a lot of memories of oppression. Um, some people have been, you know, I've been coaching a lot of women around, they felt a lot of sexual abuse trauma coming up and they were also feeling, um, and men as well. Um, and it's been really looking at our identities as who we are as a person and how we show up in the world. And what does that look like in terms of like, who do we connect with? Who's in our circles? Um, and how, where are we getting our education and learning from? You know, we were doing this. It's, it's such an important piece because there's been so much uh, movement on social media um, and movement in the world. Um, obviously, as we know that this is unprecedented, like worldwide, there's like this civil movement going on. But it's been such a powerful piece because these structures need to be changed anyways. We started with obviously COVID, where, where we had the anti-racism, anti-Asian uh, racism show up. And that was, that was hard in itself. And I mean, there was the, we had a rise in anti-Asian um, um, cases and which it's not fair for anyone to feel that. And then now we have the Black Lives Matter um, movement happening. And it's such an important piece about all these things needed to be addressed in some way. And then we had some companies who were like, well, we're not going to touch this because it's, we're not doing a political thing. And then we had other companies who are stepping into it and being like, no, this is a human rights issue. And we, we want to look at what human, how we show up as a business and what is our right as a human rights, you know, activist in some way. And it's been interesting for me working with companies where some companies were like, well, we, we made a statement. They chose not to look within and they just chose to, kind of go on with business, but they're like, well, we made a statement, we did something with it. Whereas other companies, they might have not made the statement or they might have made a more subtle statement, um, but they actually chose to look within and look at what their system, systemic systems were internally, uh, where they can create systemic change within their organization. And how can they actually influence greater change within their communities through their clientele, through their individual, through the staff, um, and just through how they show up in the world as a brand. And so at the end of the day, it, one of the things that was really prevalent for me was there were some organizations where leaders took a couple of days to make decisions um, or decide on what steps they were going to take. Like if, when it was like Monday, um, their staff was like, well, what are you going to do about it? And the, some leaders were like, look, and their thought, you know, their strength is the fact that they're thoughtful. They want to think through the actions. They want to think through, you know, are we actually aligned authentically with what statements we're making? And so they were taking a few days. And that was really interesting to watch because they were attacked by their staff members saying that you're not making decisions fast enough. And for me as a person, um, it was really interesting to hear these conversations when I'm talking to them because I'm like, what about the human conversation at this point? 
all these leaders are human as well. And they're trying to make decisions from a human place. Um, and they also have their own way of thinking and approaching life and approaching the way that they lead. Um, where others, they made some type of statement and the staff would, was, um, was like, well, why would you make a statement? Because this is like, why are we getting involved with this right now? And it also depended on companies of looking at who had, uh, you know, uh, who had uh, um, staff in the US and who had staff in Canada. Um, staff in the US were really needing something different. And they really wanted, called for more um, company engagement where st Canadian staff are like, well, is this really our issue sometimes? And are, what, why do we even have to address this? So it was just such a, it was such a dichotomy of like all these things are going on um, within organizations and what's right, what's wrong, it's hard to say. But the thing is like, we knew that some people are gonna make mistakes. And we also knew that some people are gonna do the best that they can. And, but it's always looking at when you receive the feedback, what are you gonna do after that? And you know, what is the next action you're gonna take? Um, and so what we're gonna be talking about today is really looking at, we know we're gonna make mistakes. Everyone, you know, and that's the thing, like everyone's gonna make mistakes. I make a mistake. I've been doing this work for 15 years. I've been doing diversity inclusion work for 15 years. I still use the term guys sometimes. And I try, like I always try to catch myself, but it still happens. And it's not that I'm trying to be exclusive, but it's a, it's a habit. And we're trying to undo, you know, all these years of habits that ingrainment um, in ways of being. So knowing that at the end of the day, everyone's going to make, um, make a mistake. Um, but it's also about what else? what are they doing with the transparency? Joanne had put a message in. She's like, it's about the transparency. And it is true. It is about transparency. It's about how are you communicating when you have made the mistake? How are you communicating? How are you learning from the mistake? And how are you moving forward from it? So that's what we're going to be kind of looking at covering today. Um, and we'll dive into that. So we're going to talk about what does it mean to be an ally? Um, what does inclusive communication look like? How can we use emotion to create change? And the best case of ways to educate yourself while you're learning from other people. Um, so a few things ground, ground things that, you know, with VESA, we look at diversity of thought and we look at inclusive culture. So we're gonna just, you know, just so we have language that's similar to, for all of us. Um, the biggest thing with VESA is like, with my company, we always look at equity. Um, we're looking at how do we create equitable conditions for individuals so they have opportunities that otherwise they should have been have access to anyways. So when we're looking at hiring, uh, when we're working with companies on what does diversity look like within the company, we actually focus on what is the diversity of thought? You know, what is the different, the different thought patterns and the backgrounds? Um, where are we providing equal and equitable opportunities to people of all similar skills? Where are we allowing, what, who needs to be at the table and whose voices need to be heard? Um, where are we tapping into perspectives and lenses? Like, are we listening to what who, the customers that we're serving? Like, are we listening to people who actually understand our customers better than we are? And it's not about customers, it's just external, it's internal. Staff are customers of the organization as well. You know, like, where are we actually listening? How are, is the internal team reflective of the external who we're serving as well? And that's why it's important to have a workplace that reflects the communities that we serve. Inclusion, um, I love inclusion. So it's like, it's the best thing is about how do you create a place where people feel like they belong and are accepted and they can be themselves and they can bring their whole selves forward. I, so growing up, I will talk, so I'm gonna kind of like digress a little bit and tell a little bit about my story because, and why I ended up doing the work that I did. Um, it's actually really funny because I just kind of figured this out like a, two, year, two years ago of like how long this was embedded in in part of my psyche and a part of who I was. So I grew up in Kamloops, uh, BC, um, grew up to immigrant parents, um, and my parents had made a decision for us to live on a certain part of town because there would be less um, South Asians there. And my parents had their own biases around what it meant for us to live around South Asians. And so they, my mom, I would come home, I always tell, so my parents are aware that I tell these stories all the time. So, you know, I've cleared it with them at this point. Um, I would come home and my mom would be like, oh, what do the white kids eat for lunch? What do they, what time do, what's their curfew? Like, and all these things, because she's like, she wanted to understand what the Canadian way of doing things was. And it was interesting because growing up then I was like, it somehow in my brain, it got embedded that I was like a second class citizen at some point because it was like asking about what other people were doing um, rather than what are we going to do as Canadians? Because I thought I was Canadian. 
And um, then there was a whole time per period where um, I just wanted to be white. So I had a white, fake white name that I would use or like imagine like if I was just white, this would have been so much easier. This would have been just better and like life would be easy. Um, yeah, that's, yeah, it's not uh, the case anymore because life is just amazing as it is. And then when I, but I grew up, all my friends growing up in school, um, we had like out of a grad class of like 500 people, we had 30 minorities. Most of us hung out together. And it wasn't the indigenous, it was like people of color. So it was really interesting now, like I'm reflecting back on who we, how we were. And, um, but none of us knew that we all spoke a second language until about 10 years after graduation. Cause we never talked about it. We just kind of like, we just fit in. We just did what we did. I mean, mind you, I'm also older. So it was a very different era at that point. And then when I moved to Vancouver, I was, you know, all of a sudden I started hanging out with all like South Asians because I felt like finally I'm like, oh, people understand me. They understand what's going on at home. And then I was like, well, did I ever like feel like I belonged growing up? You know, and I started questioning that. I'm like, did I ever feel that I was accepted? I was like, I was accepted, but I never felt like I belonged because I was always kind of like our culture influences influencing how we showed up. Um, there wasn't people like me who would have careers that, or I didn't have role models that had similar experiences to me. And so, and then in um, 20, uh, 2005, I started working for a, I started volunteering for a self, uh, arts organization. And I started looking at how cultures, um, we bring cultures together through arts and uh, how we can actually bring, uh, have more understanding when we can see similarities between ourselves. And we did an Israeli Bhangra dance. It's actually like one of the best things that I've ever, one of the best projects I've ever worked on. It's on YouTube, go search it. But it's about, we did this Israeli Bhangra fusion where it was looking at folk dances for both, but looking at how similar they were, but then also celebrating the differences. And so I got to project manage that. So that was really exciting for me. Um, but that's where my, like the diversity inclusion work started. Cause I was like, all of a sudden, I'm like, we brought down, you know, Bhangra, like the South Asian art to that downtown core. People, you know, people who had never been exposed to it, all of a sudden were exposed to it. But they're like, oh, we understand you better. Like even my coworkers would show up and they're like, we just understand how, who you are a little bit more. And when it was like, so then I started creating these cultural days that when I was working at UBC, where we bring like ethnic food, bring your food from your country. And this is like back in like 2007, like it was, you know, it's, it's just so funny now to think about this, but, um, and talk about what, you know, what are things from your country that influence you at work? And there was like these cases where one of the women, she's like, I'm Korean and I don't speak up in meetings all the time because we have like this cultural thing at work, like back in Korea that we don't speak up. And then I had, um, I, one of my staff members was Chinese and she was like, she would never disagree with me. And I'd always be like, I know that you don't agree, but why aren't you disagreeing? She'd just be like, uh-huh, yeah. And she'd walk away. She wouldn't do what I asked. And then finally I'm like, what is going on? She's like, I can't disagree with you because, you know, because culturally you're part of like, you're, I have authority, but I don't agree with you. So I'm not going to do it. So it was like this whole, like learning about how culture actually still influences in the workplace. And um, because of the arts work that we did, we got invited to a lot of VIP events and there would be very few people of color in those rooms. And so we would show up and we, all of us people that like looked, you know, similar, we would start hanging out with each other because we just were like, oh yeah, we made it. Like, it was kind of this like, oh, okay, you understand where I came from. You understand how hard it was to get here. But then I was like, oh, this isn't right. So we started a South Asian women's networking group, started doing gender equality work um, and working at different levels uh, within the province. And it started, I was like, I looked at the ethnic, we called it ethnic at that point. We don't really always use those words anymore. But we got this round table of ethnic women together and all the struggle from across like different cultures. The struggles were the same. They were like, lack of role models, lack of mentors, um, feeling like, you know, there's no one else who has blazed the path before us, or even if they have, we don't have access to them. And all the, and it, it just, I started thinking about this. I'm like, well, it's a women's issue, but then there's also this other layer of like cultural issue that goes underneath. And a lot of the times that these women were taught, you know, they were talking about, they're like, we're taught not to be seen, not to be heard when we're at home. Uh, don't speak up too much. Don't laugh too much. Don't like speak your mind too much. You might not get married, all these things, right? So it was just, it was really interesting to start that work at that point. Um, over the years, ended up moving, moved around to quite a, um, traveled quite a bit. And the issues were similar across every country we go to. It's just a different scale. 
we did some work in Croatia, did some work in India, did some work in Netherlands, and coming back to Canada and US, like the numbers, numbers might be different, the issues, challenges are the same. And so it's the lens that I bring to these conversations is always like, we know that we can make a difference. We've seen the numbers change. Um, unfortunately with COVID, we're starting to see the numbers reverse a little bit because of opportunities. But this is where it's so important to think about um, who, like, who I had to be and who did I need to connect myself with in order to, and how can I stand up for someone else? And so just like a year and a half ago, I just realized that when I was 13, I decided that I didn't like racism, I didn't like sexism, and I didn't like um, war. And it's so interesting because a lot of the work I do is all in all those areas. Now. So a lot of these pathways, like we always know what our pathway is going to be, but it's always about, it was about equality for someone else. It was always about how do we create spaces where other people feel safe. And that's where the work has led into like this inclusion culture work because I was always interested in if people are feeling safe and they feel like they belong and accepted in the workplace, will they be more productive? Will they actually feel that they feel powerful? It's not about productivity in the sense of like productivity. It's about feeling powerful. And when you have your own power, you're likely to help other people have their power. And then we can have societies where everyone feels like they're powerful. So that's actually the work that we end up, I end up doing is like, thinking about how do we pe make people feel that they have all the power in the world to create the change that they want, because you do. So that's something like, that's where inclusion really is important. Um, and so it's one of my, like my passions is the fact that how do we get people to feel like so aligned to their own heart, to their soul, to their why, because, and when they can communicate that out into the workplace on a daily basis, they are gonna be so, they're gonna be stepping into so much of their power through their strengths that they will up level other everyone else around them as well. So, um, so with also inclusion is looking at the intersectionality, intersectionality of identity and all the different components that make us who we are. And I'm just gonna leave that there for now because that's the great diagram. Um, so going into allyship, one of the biggest things is it has been my pet peeve for the last couple of months. When people just call themselves allies, um, don't unless someone else tells you you're an ally, please just then be like, okay, then I can. Because otherwise when we, you know, there's so many articles about this too. We have this on the website under, like there's a couple articles on the VESA website. When we declare ourselves an ally, but someone else hasn't declared it, um, we're actually, again, we're doing privilege again. And so it's important to be in support of someone else, um, be aligned to their mission, be aligned to their purpose. But allyship is really about you're saying that you really understand what they're going through. And you, um, even though it's from, an empath, uh, from a place of empathy, but it's really important to like, you, none of us can experience what someone else is experiencing. Regardless, because none of us are made up the same way. That's where intersectionality of identity comes up. We have so many different components of who we are. So allyship is really when, if someone's gone through a similar situation, sometimes, you know, it does happen. But it usually happens when you've gone, you have a lot of the traits of the intersectionality that are similar that you will understand. You can really truly be an ally. So I always suggest use um, use the words I, I'm a you know supportive of the um, of their cause or I'm being in alignment with what their cause is or in what their purpose is. Using those type of words. Um, and then also one of the biggest things is like when we're supportive of their, everyone else. I love this quote, but it's about when we raise our voices, um, it's so that when there's voices missing from the table, we can actually get them heard as well. And that's the most important piece of like what any, any of us can do to be inclusive and create inclusive workplaces as well. And then there's more definition about allyship, but you can go see that um, as well. Because I want to leave time just for have conversations as well. So. You know, and then we're just going to quickly touch on unconscious bias. So I know there's been a lot of conversations of what does unconscious bias mean right now. And I have had people say to me, they're like, what do you think about unconscious bias training? And I think that it's, it's a lifetime of work. Like unconscious bias is a lifetime of work because the more you can become aware of who you are, the more become aware of what your thought patterns are. Like you're not, a, a, one training session is not going to help you do that. You know, it's, um, it's really about each moment being like, 
and just becoming conscious of who you are as a person. That's really what it comes down to. And some of the examples are gonna, I'm going to give are conscious and unconscious because we're not going to fully go into unconscious bias during this time. But it's really about, but one of the biggest things is like with any kind of unconscious bias, you are going to act in a way that you've been, it's been ingrained in you or it's been, you've been taught it in certain ways, you've been programmed in certain ways. So again, it's not about the thought that matters. It's about the action that you take right after you've had that thought. That makes a difference. As the fire alarm go, uh, the fire trucks go by. And when you're, and yeah, they're really loud. Um, <laughs> so we're just going to go with that. But this is where, when we're making the unconscious conscious, it's about, you know, when you have that thought, when you're like, we're going to do this quick exercise here. When you look at this picture, you'll see that there's certain pictures that you're really connected to. And I would love to hear in the chat, which are the pictures you connected to. What was the first thing that popped up for you as you looked at this picture? And so as you're popping that into the chat, you know, some of it, this, this is where the unconscious bias will come, the conscious and unconscious bias. The unconscious bias is there's going to be the affinity bias. People that you connect to right away based on like relatability or you feel like there's something um, that's warm about it, uh, there's an affinity to them. Then there's going to be others that you're connected to because there's going to be a trigger based on some other experience. So, you know, this is where like, when we have unconscious bias, we kind of look at when we see something, what are the first thoughts that we have that without even thinking about it? That's usually where unconscious bias creeps in. Where do we kind of act a certain way based on, or be a, have a certain thought or be a certain way based on without thinking about it? That's where it is. And so there's five types of unconscious bias. Um, so affinity bias is about feeling connected and similar to people that you connect to in some way. Like, you know, it's like, the law, you know, when we're all traveling, like one of the biggest things is I love meeting Canadians because I'm always like, oh, you're Canadian, even though they live on Montreal or something. Um, and I'll get so excited for them, you know, and it's just like, and I do have halo effect because I'm right away. I'm like, they're Canadian. They're going to be amazing. And they're going to, it's like right away. I'm like, yep, they're awesome. Um, or Horan's effect, when we have, we've been trained by media, we've been trained by um, our own upbringing about having a perception about someone that has a negative trait, right? And going back to the example where people are from, there might be a country you're like, oh no, that's a country that we don't want to touch, um, based on the fact that something that has, that has influenced your thought patterns that way. Attribution bias, like growing up in a South Asian family, how often, you know, if someone's a doctor, it's like, oh my God, they're so amazing. And it's just because they're a doctor, they're an engineer, they're a lawyer, and my family doesn't know what I do. So it's like perfect because like they, they can never have an attribution of bias towards me. It's amazing. Um, and then confirmation bias is like when we're actually looking for something to reinforce um, what um, we've already thought about. So that's where that is. If there's any questions on that, please uh, let me know. And then I can't see the chat right now. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to support work with you on that. So now we're just going to tap into tips for being a better support in Alliance. First of all, understand yourself. Like this is the biggest thing. Um, after this, um, all of you are going to receive a leadership guide. Um, and one of the things I will comment is like the re reason why we use the words cultural di culturally diverse with Beza is Inclusivity is one of my values. And I remember when I started the company, I was talking to someone and she's like, I'm like, oh yeah, women of color. And she goes, and she was like, I'm Hungarian, I'm an immigrant. I grew up in poverty here in Canada. So I'm not included in all of the things, all the work that you do. I'm like, oh, wait a second. I'm like, oh yeah. And then she's like, plus we have the Hungarian culture and all these like, and, and then I was like talking to some of my Latino friends and all of a sudden I'm like, wait a second. It's not, there's a whole, this is about how culture influences us. And there's so many different cultures that influence us. The culture of Vancouver is very different than Ottawa, then very different than Toronto and Calgary. Like growing up in, you know, I grew up in Kamloops. That's a very different way of being. Like I know a lot of my friends, we were like, oh, you're from a small town. We have again, affinity bias. We're right away, we're like, let's be friends because we're all from a small town because we think that we're better than everyone. It's amazing. Um, but we're not, obviously. 
Um, but then it's like, yeah, so understand your own unconscious bias. So the leadership guide will help you try to start to dive into that a little bit more. Um, think about when you're out, when you're in meetings or when you're being a part of projects um, or when you're in any room, just think, look around and be like, who needs to be here? Who isn't here? What voice needs to be represented here that has, isn't being represented? And even taking that one moment, like makes a big difference in being a better support and uh, being in alliance with someone. And one of the other things is like, also when the voice isn't there, speak up for them. If, the, if you're gonna be representing a, like say you're on a committee and you're representing a group of people, making sure that you're actually going back to that group and saying, hey, this is what's coming up in the meeting. Like, what is it that you, what's important to you right now? How can I speak up for you um, since you're not part of, like not everyone, you can't be in every room. Like no one can be in every room, but this is where when we are, you know, when we're being a support for someone else's, someone else, we can actually still speak up for them still collect their thoughts, still like, like, you know what, like I had a conversation with this person and this is what they wanted to bring up. Don't make assumptions, make, get, get to know people as individuals. Like how often, one of the biggest, and I'm, I, uh, it makes it really hard for me to say this because I know that this is not the time to say this, but I'm like, one of the things like in this whole movement in the last couple of months, um, is remembering that people are people. Humans are humans. It's not, we're not defined by the color of our skin. We're not defined by what disability we have, like, or what our gender preference, like, you know, sexual preferences or any of those kind of things. It's, we're defined, at the end of the day, we're all human. And humans have so much to offer into this world. You know, like, at, every person has a strength. Every person has something that they can really, um, they have a gift to offer. There's, out of like, the best quote I heard was like, out of a trillion cells, you were chosen to be here. Because you have a purpose. Like you have a gift to bring into this world. If out of a trillion cells, your cell makeup brought you here, that just goes to show that you have something to step into. And you have a strength to bring forward. And if we remember that, someone else was one of, you know, one of trillion cells that cho got chosen to be here, then we remember that they have a gift as well and we just need to see it. Uh, think about things one step for further. So this one, it's always looking at what's underneath. Like someone's, what someone's saying is sometimes not what they're really meaning. So how do we dive into like actually listening to them and being present with them and actually really hearing what they're saying and instead of taking things at a face value all the time. Because I know that we're all busy, it's really hard to sit there and listen. I have that thing too, because I'm always trying to like, let's go, let's go, let's do something. But it's like sometimes you just need to pause, being like, did they really mean what they said, or is there something else in here that I need to understand? And just that thing. Be patient. Um, you know, think about where you need to uh, accommodate in your communication style. So my communication style is very directive. And sometimes, many times, I, if I'm talking to someone who's a very, like, and I can go into participative, like I always like to get people's viewpoints and stuff, but I know that my directive, my style will come up where I will interrupt because I get really excited. And, or I'll get to like, oh my God, I have an idea. But that's not, doesn't help someone else who, that's not their communication style. So I have to be really conscious about who am I communicating with in front of me. And, you know, and even if we're sitting in a group of meetings, and then some people are just like more introverted or they're more reflective, um, where are we giving them space to speak up as well? And how, like when we're in meetings thinking about who hasn't spoken up during this meeting, whose voice hasn't been heard even in that meeting, um, has their feedback been incorporated in some way, even if they don't speak up? You know, we can get feedback through writing or whatever else that is, but making sure that that's there. Educate yourself. Don't put the on onus on others to educate you. I mean, we've heard this multiple times now. It's not something that's new. Because um, the thing is, I, you know, it, it's interesting because I like, when I moved to the Netherlands, I was like, I wanted to learn so much about Dutch culture. And my family, my friend who's Dutch, she's like, stop asking me questions. She's like, I'm not the only source. And I'm like, but I'm just so curious. And she's like, yeah, stop it. And she's like, here, go read this. And, you know, but it was funny though, because then afterwards, like a week later, she's like, so 
let's talk about all these questions you had. She's like, I was tired that day. But you know, it's like one of those, <laughs> it was, but it was, it was exhausting for her. Cause I'm like asking her about everything, you know, about the culture. I was like, so what do you guys eat? And she's like, really? You've been to how many restaurants at this point? You're still asking us? So it was just, one of those. and I said guys right there again. So, you know, catching myself again. Uh, be open um, and accepting of feedback um, both ways. Like, I mean, it's so important. Feedback is constructive. Feedback is important. We also have to understand some cultures don't um, receive feedback the same way. And they find it, and it depends on who's giving the feedback. And so it's really important to understand that feedback is a way for you to just be better or just to have a better relationship, even if you don't need to change at that moment or you choose not to change. Um, it's about listening to the other person so that they can be heard as well and that maybe there's something for you to and ponder. And as a starting point, um, ask how, like, you know, when you have your conversation, ask how someone else is thinking about the situation rather than assuming. Um, you know, I, I think that some of the clients that we've been working with lately, like one of the conversations was some, um, you know, some of the BIPOC staff are like, I'm tired. I, this is not a conversation I want to be part of anymore. So I'm tired of people asking me to be like on the Bi BIPOC committee or being on this and stuff like that. Everyone's at different places and everyone's having different emotions. And we're talking about BIPOC care, but it goes back to anything. Like ask someone else how they're really feeling about it and what, how they understand the situation because that's when you can actually truly create connection as well and really be an alliance, uh, supportive of them. And um, so also looking at like give out the space to other, other people to have opportunities that they wouldn't have access to. Goes back to, um, you know, if you find out a board, like opportunity to have a job or a board role or there's a project, to invite someone else to apply. Like I just had a conversation with someone who's very high up, very well known. And I remember there was a board position that I had been asked to, to um, be on. And I was like, I didn't feel like I was the right person. So I said to her, I'm like, hey, by the way, I think this is like, this board position would be better for you. Like you should apply. And this is like my weeks ago. I didn't even think about it. I just sent it to her, nothing else. And um, she actually said to me today, she's like, honestly, like by you giving me that board opportunity, like, opportunity she's like no one thinks about me anymore because people just think that opportunities just come to me because i'm you know she's very successful and she goes i still have to work for them but people don't offer me opportunities anymore and she's like at that point i could i knew that i could trust you and that you're gonna just open doors regardless of like who people are and what level they're at and but it was like it was just such a because i'm like people have done that for me constantly people the boards that i've been on people have offered me you know, open doors for me and champion, being a champion of me, um, put my name forward. And that's one of the things, the best way, things that we can do. Don't pretend which, um, to understand what, you know, what others are going through. Empathy is about meeting them where they're at and then coming back to where you're at. Because you're not going to have, you can't fully experience what they're experiencing either. Um, give space for others to speak up and have a voice. We don't always have to talk. Like today, I feel weird because I'm talking the entire time. Um, but you know, this is why I'm here. Uh, but it was like, you know, it's interesting because sometimes like we all have so much to say or we have so much to contribute, but we don't are, sometimes it's just chatter. And I, if you're, I think about like, am I going to add value right now? If you're going to add value, speak up. If you feel like someone else will add more value, allow them to speak as well um listen to others we talked about know your know their pronouns and how they identify you know i've asked people like what their pronouns are and be aware of that be aware of microaggressions like how uh we we a couple of friends we had this joke where like we've gone into like we're at south by southwest and we were sitting there talking someone comes up to us and they're like you speak english so well because all of us are different backgrounds and we started laughing we're like I guess we do, <laughs> like, I guess we do. And, but it, their intention was not that, but it was like, but it was, a, it was a joke, a running joke every time we speak, we're like, oh, you speak English so well. Thanks for showing up. Like, thanks for being here. And obviously, please don't do that. That's not, you know, think about, you know, what are you making a judgment about? So looking at inclusive communication, this is like really cool. So what you, so with inclusive communication, is thinking about when you're the list, what, what does a listener need to hear so that they can feel this, they're a part of the communication or like the reader, whatever that is. 
So when you're communicating, like I love the app Texaco, like text, um, T-E-X-T-I-O. Um, it's for job descriptions and looking at gender inclusivity and job descriptions, but it's been such a great tool for me to use in other things as well. Because then I'm like, oh, how, what language am I using? Am I using very masculine language or femi feminine language? This isn't about gender. So fem masculine um, leadership traits are, um, are about goals. They're about getting to like the quotas, um, meeting the and you know, getting things done. Where feminine leadership traits are about empathy, relationship building, strategy, um, looking at the long-term vision, thinking about people. So when you're using like any language you're using, are you using a balance of both feminine and masculine, masculine? Because then that's when we're actually really speaking to other, all individuals and all parts of individuals as well. And also inclusive communication, like remember that what you're saying is not what someone might be hearing. So this is where I did, it was one of those things, paraphrasing was so hard for me for the longest time. And, but it's like, just actually even pausing and like, so this is what I'm hearing, is that what you're saying? And actually having a dialogue about it and actually giving space for people to like talk. You know, it's, um, there was this exercise I did in this um, course called Authentic Relating. I love it. I love the course. Um, but it was like just the other person just talked for five minutes about something and I just had to listen. And within those five minutes, I learned so much about the other person where I was like, wow, how often am I actually listening or am I actually hearing what someone else is saying? Because if, if I had, because my the rule was that I had to just sit there and listen. Um, I wasn't even thinking about what I had to say because I was actually just being present with them. So when we're being present with someone else, we're actually in our hearts. We're actually like really connected to what's going on with them. We can actually feel their emotions and where they're like, we can relate to them in a lot different way and build rapport. And when we're building rapport, that's when people feel like they have belonging and they're connected as well. And so, and then using emotions as fuel. Um, like we're in a space where there's a lot of rage and anger right now. There's a lot of sadness, grief. Um, there's so many different, um, so many different things of like emotions right now. I would love to hear what are some of the emotions people are feeling over the last couple of months. I mean, we've kind of like dived, you know, we kind of kind of come over the hump, but like. Let's see, like, what are people, emotions people are still feeling? There's still confusion. There's still denial. There's still the anger. Um, we're feeling this, like, collective grief um, from COVID. Um, you know, and, but the thing is, we, emotions can be such, so powerful and to use as fuel. So I was with a coaching client this morning. We were talking about this. And she was like, I feel so frustrated because, like, um, things aren't changing with what I want, want to get, want to do. People aren't listening to what I have to say. And I was like, well, with that frustration, what can, you, what can you do to create frustration and anger actually allow us to create new systems? Because they actually, there's like a fire that builds. When there's a fire, we can actually burn things down, even our own belief systems down. It actually allows us to create something new. So I am not like a social, like I do social justice, but in a more gentle way. And I'm not the one that's going to be out there um, I'm not about burning down like all the buildings or anything else like that. And you can see from the way I speak. Um, but I do feel that we can break, break systems down and system, make systemic change through using fuel to as a way to create positive change. So when we create positive change through fuel, uh, a positive change through emotions, we, we will do things that are in the greater good for everyone. We'll take a stand. And that's when we can use like all these emotions for actually like a powerful place of like, who do I need to connect with? Who do I need? What do I need to want to change? Um, and how do I create that change? And stepping into that. And so emotions is like, there's so much power in emotions. Like, and even when we feel so much grief, grief is like, grief is a place of like how much you care. And that's what it is. Like grief is such a place of like how much you love and how much you care. And that's why you're feeling this immense grief. So when we can use that grief of like, okay, I have so much love to like reallocate at this point. Um, where does our love need to go? Who do I need to connect with that needs the love right now? And that's when we actually can work and like we volunteer and that's exporting the love that way. We use it with coworkers or we use it on other part of other projects. And that's where like, it's kind of, and sadness is like so great because sadness is like the, the loss of something, but now something new can come in. 
So all these emotions have so much positivity to them and it's just about how do we use it as a fuel to do something more with it. And okay, so now I'm gonna stop sharing because I want to hear from everyone. And then I can, perfect. Um, so I'm gonna just, any questions? And as we're thinking about this now. Okay, I am just looking. I love all the, thank you for sharing all the different emotions and everything else and like the roller coaster, like so true. Um, you know, it's like super powerful. So, so what are some actions that you can take um, thinking about this, like that you would wanna take as, you know, moving forward um, that could help be supportive to someone else? What's one thing that you're like, I would love to be able to do this, or um, I, I can do this tomorrow and I feel like this will make a change. Sharing experiences is amazing. Because when we share our experiences, people can engage with who we are, right? And it was, um, you know, when we have the piece of vulnerability, um, it's so interesting because we hear vulnerability all the time. And I was like watching this move, I was watching, uh, shouldn't you know say this because it's like trash tv but it's so worth it uh single wives uh club on netflix with matthew hussey um and so it's so learning about dating um <laughs> and so when but they were talking about vulnerability and we hear benet brown talk about vulnerability and it's amazing and it was like and it was like but i was like watching this show and i'm watching the girl and she's like well i was being vulnerable because i was telling my story but he, the Matthew Hussey was like, goes, goes back to her, he's like, but people couldn't feel your emotion. They couldn't feel your human side. And when people can feel that you're human, that's when they can actually engage and support you and actually help you do whatever they need to do to support a great change as well. And so, yeah, like, I love Matthew Hussey too. It's so funny. He's really cute too. I mean, that always helps. Um, but yeah, so that's it's such an important piece. Um, but yeah, so Nika, like, uh, Nika? Um, the meeting advice in terms of reading the room. Yeah, for sure. And ensuring that people's voices are heard. Um, yeah, it's so interesting. Like when, even when we're on Zoom calls like right now, you know how often like I was like calling out one of my friends, we were on a meeting and I was calling her out because I was like, every time we go onto a Zoom call, you're never on video. And she's like, well, I'm not ready or I have like this. And I'm like, yeah, but as women, like especially, especially when you're a woman of color, like you need to show up. Like you need to take your space. You know, I know Zoom fatigue because I'm feeling it all the time right now. But if you're not on video, like honestly, take the space you earned that space where you're at. And you deserve to be there and people need to see you. And so, you know, it's like such an important piece of like you are in this again, you are in this world to take up space. Allow other people to take up space too. Like that's why I called her out because I was like, look, like we're part of these meetings. If people don't see your face, they can't connect with you, connect to you. They're not, they don't know, you know, like they see a name and that's it. And, you know, it's like, we all have our reasons why we won't go on video all the time, especially when someone's presenting or whatever else. And I think that there's ways to like protect your energy that way. But it's also when, when there's a dialogue kind of happening, important to this, even if you don't have something to contribute at that moment, but take that space, but don't take it just because like, you know, it's not like when people are just like, oh, I, uh, on emails, they'll just like write in something just to be in agreement, just to be a part of the thread. Like that doesn't mean, you know, really look at how you're adding value as well, right? Um, exactly. Like it's Angie, like it's okay if you don't like the lighting or whatever you're wearing. People do because people, especially like these days, like, there's so many emotions going on. People just want to see other people smile and they want to connect with humans, you know, like, and it's like, you want to have that human connection and feel because you had to remember there's someone else on the other side. When we, when, we, when we remember there's a human on the other side that has feelings and they have blood flowing through their veins like we do, we're less likely to have all these like separation from them. And that's when we actually will stand in alignment with them to create inclusive culture as well. So when someone, if you kind of notice like someone hasn't been on, like, you know, if you're like somewhere and someone hasn't been on video for a while, just check and be like, hey, I noticed that for the last like, five meetings, you haven't been on video. I just wanted to check in, like, is everything, like, what's going on and anything that can support you. 
because we would love to see your face or like once in a while, like it doesn't have to be all the time, right? That's always helpful. Um, but yeah, like, I mean, it, it, the no webcam, like I, I totally get that. But sometimes just like jump on the phone then if you need to, like I actually like, I actually use my phone if there's sometimes I don't want to be on video. So I will just jump on the phone to say hi. And then I like log in through the computer. And then I don't, at least I can like make that connection as well. So that helps. But then it's, you know, this is where it's about you, um, each of us showing up, but then also help, helping someone else show up as well. In understanding like there's, that's a technical thing, right? Um, on the, with, with no webcam. But then it's like, how do you, you know, if there's someone, like, is there a way that you can talk to your manager about like being like, hey, I want to be included at part of these conversations. I have this, you know, technical limitation, but what can you be done to like, um, change that as well because these are the things that we this is how it's about asking to be included but also finding support and be included as well what else is a step that you would take or action or question that you have i would love for someone to like pop you know turn your uh come on the microphone and stuff as well if you want to come on and ask a question Um, um, yeah. in the chat. But I really like that this is what I'm hearing. Is that what you're saying, Lynn, that you had mentioned? Because I think in a lot of conversations, that's really useful versus for active listening. Um, but I find now with a lot of the different movements going on, when approaching these kind of conversations that can become more heated just because of the different topics and everything, how would you say, I guess, or what are some of the practices you've seen that have been more successful and being productive as opposed to just kind of being combative if you people have different um i guess sides or different opposing views on the different issues um the biggest thing is like creating space so people can be heard like at the end of the day people are just wanting to be heard because they want their 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 voices um have been suppressed for so long and if we create a space where people can be heard that's what makes the conversation productive and if it becomes combative it's actually like allowing space to just taking a deep breath and just like, okay, let's listen to what's going on for you really. And again, it's like that technique of like just listening for a couple minutes where the person can just talk it through. It's such a powerful technique. Um, I was, you know, talking, we had a, a situation where um, with a client where um, it got really combative and I, I'm like, I'm the consultant, I'm facilitating. And they were just, they were very angry. And there's nothing that we could have done about the situation at that time. But uh, Regardless, like they went on, a, they went on for about five minutes. But really, just ha them having the space. All of a sudden, they calm down. They're like, "Oh, wait a second! I just realized." And they just had this like all these realizations because they've never been able to have space to talk it through, right? And it, it, then it led to this whole productive conversation where they're so much more engaged with creating change at this point. Um, it's and that's where like, you know, we just have gotta be, yeah, be, like. In, you know, have the conversation, be present for it and just allow it to happen. Really, that's what most, going back to simple communication tools, like it goes back to that. That's the best way to approach it. And then also they're just asking people like, okay, you know what, I understand, I, I'm feeling this from you. Is this what, I, is this correct? Like if you're feeling like frustration or anger, or whatever, is this, I'm, I'm feeling this, is this what, what you're experiencing? And just even knowing, because in that way, what you might be experiencing is not what they might be feeling. Anyone else? Yeah, I love the question, like how can I best support you in this situation, right? It's like, that's one of the best questions we can ask because people at the end of the day, they know what they need and they know that um, that's, they, and if, when they're asked, when they're asked that question, it's like the most important thing because like, Sometimes they might not even know the answer to that, but it's like giving them the opportunity to answer that as well. Um, so navigating a large discussion session um, where you want to create a safe space, but want to ensure others um, are there speaking. So one of the biggest thing in large discussion sessions is kind of setting the ground rules, obviously, as we kind of know. 
but then also knowing that if something comes up that might be so i was in a situation where one of our clients um one of the staff members decided um to call this entire management team white supremacist and we had to I, we were facilitating a conversation with like 40 other people and it was triggering for everyone on different levels for, she was a white woman but she was like it was triggering for everyone on very different levels and she was she just had a lot to say and it was interesting though because it was like one of the best things that you know i think i dealt with it in the best way possible but we also had a conversation about it afterwards and with others who were part of the conversation with her as well but the biggest thing was like she got to the opportunity to explain why she felt that and what it meant to her and what that word means to her where other people were triggered by it because the language was different for them so when we actually started to see what language actually means for each person all of a sudden it became a safer space because they're like oh what she meant was not what i thought it was or she did mean that but it was like not applicable in this way like it just so that kind of um having that common language amongst people and amongst large groups um really helps and then also knowing like one of the things with zoom it's like we're a little bit um it's a little bit easier to navigate uh interruptions uh with zoom because a lot of people are you know they kind of it's balanced differently um but it's also just knowing that if someone as a facilitator or if you're like a part of a group and so other people are you're part of the conversation if someone's not being heard is you know actually just piping up and being like hey i heard i've been listening i've been trying i'm trying to listen to what so and so is saying because they've been trying to speak up and they're trying to finish their thought can we can we just hear them and that's what it what it means to give space for someone else to speak as well and creating a safe space for them to continue the thought or actually let walk away from it as well so it's you know sometimes you do have to take a stand in that sense and being like instead of like just listening and being like okay well that person has interrupted like four people or they keep interrupting the same person and actually just stepping up and being like look we're trying to listen to what so and so needs has been trying to say for the last like couple minutes could we just listen to what they need to say and that itself starts to create like you're creating your, you can feel the energy behind it it actually creates a space for that so and so to continue what they need to say and the other person who was interrupting to kind of understand oh i need to back off right and so that's where you can kind of start creating space that way as well the guidelines right away like that's so important um having like what are safety guidelines for people and what what they what a safe space mean safe space also means different things for different people and that's where like when you're getting to, going back to like simple things as team charters like it's so important to go back to like team charters about how do you create a safe space for each for people to be heard as well um so we're nearing the end of our time one of the things i would love to do is hear from others hear from everyone what is one of your biggest takeaways or um or one thing you're grateful for and just kind of type it in because we always want to end with gratitude for each other for ourselves but then also when we know what there's one action that we can commit to and or one takeaway that we can be like this is what i'm going to reflect upon it actually makes a difference as well so we'd love to hear in the chat um, um, what that is for each of you. I know some of you, I know some of you on the line, I know you have something to say, so come on, say it. Because if, if you don't respond, then I'm gonna be like, oh, you never had, didn't have any takeaways and it was not, you know. So I don't want to feel like that. No, I'm just joking. I love it to feel this time. I force people to stop and think more for sure. Just listening, yep. And uh, letting go of judgment as well. Uh, giving people space to speak their emotions, so true. Um, yep, the ally conversation. Showing up more, I love that. Appreciate that idea of reaching out, yeah. The tips, that's good. awesome. And educate yourself, not expecting others to uh, give you answers. 
one of the things is like, you know, I always have a hard time with this because one of my best connection pieces when I'm traveling is like, I love learning about culture. I love learning about where people's experiences are. So I'm always find this one harder because I'm like, oh, but don't other people like talking about it as much as I do? But it's, um, but it's always just kind of asking them like, hey, do you mind sharing or not, right? So showing up, yeah. Who, someone unmuted themselves. Want to speak or? Hi, yeah, it, it's Hamani, sorry. Took a while to get the uh, mic going here on Zoom. So I just wanted to circle back on your whole comment where you said that we should encourage people, um, especially like if you're women of color and everyone to like be present and show yourselves on video calls. Yeah. But in this day and age, um, with my team, I'm fighting between providing them the freedom with the home home life balance and like with kids running around and just kind of more going off of how their gut feel. So yeah. while I and it's important, but I also know like, okay, you're probably in your PJ is not ready. You're not comfortable. I don't want you to lose face feeling unconfident instead of forcing you to kind of come online. So any suggestions on how to kind of promote that? Because as we continue to move forward in this whole work from home or more of a, a long-term work from home environment, I feel like people are kind of setting into their ways now where it's harder to kind of revert them back into like, okay keep a routine yeah make your camera on every so often but like any advice from that sense no I, I also don't think like I agree with you because it's um it is so hard when you're in this uh you know with everything going on and with all the pressures that are um, within the homes and everything else um I don't think that we you know I personally don't like being on camera every time either because I think that you know it's it's exhausting to look at a screen because you just have to be on. You're not getting the feedback from the other people and all those things. Um, my suggestion, as I think, I think I mentioned it, but it was like, if they haven't been on for a while, just be kind of checking and be like, Hey, we would love to see you on in the next, you know, in the next couple of meetings, can you just show up at least once and like, just show your face? Cause we would love to see your face on there. And even though, and so it kind of gives them still the choice of when that works for them. Um, it gives them the autonomy to do that, but it's also really allows them to still, um, because otherwise, because, you know, it's the same thing with emails. Like people forget there's this person behind the screen, right? And it's just that really the connectedness. And with remote teams, like I've been working in remote uh, teams for about, I don't know, I started like 10, 12 years ago. And that was the biggest thing that we started to find when we were doing just phone only. Um, and when we would just go on a video, just even having the, being like, we would just actually plan. We're like, we're going to have a team meeting on video where everyone, please come on video if you can. And ideally, please come on video. And it would be like the one bit, you know, one meeting, like every once a month. And people would show up. And we found that afterwards, there was like this huge level of engagement that we didn't have if people were just showing up behind a screen all the time. So I strong, like kind of looking at what would work with your team. Because especially like given the kids situation and um, just, yeah, the routines have kind of gone away. But like just asking like, which meeting, you know, it, when can we do a one meeting where everyone's on the video? So it's not that it just makes it easier because sometimes like, even if sometimes you show up on video and other people aren't, you kind of just like, why am I, why am I on video? Like when other people don't, you know, they're not there. So that, does that help? Yeah. It does. Yep. Thank you. Um, yeah. Lots of great takeaways here. Thank you. Thanks for validating me. I really appreciate it. No. <laughs> Um, I'm just being cheeky today, sorry. Um, yeah, any other questions before we kind of log off? Or... Okay, Rita, I'll pass it back to you and then I'm going to take it. All right. Um, thank you so much, Manpreet, for sharing your time, energy, and your experience with us. We all have some great takeaways to look forward to and practice. And Thank you everyone for joining us for this amazing event and sharing your unique experience and your thoughts as well. We really appreciate that. Um, I'm Amrita and I'm the events team lead. So you can reach out if there are any other events that you would like to see in a similar space. You can reach out to me on LinkedIn or anywhere that you see me. Um, so thank you so much for taking out the time uh, to make equity, diversity and inclusion a reality in our lives as well as our workplaces. Thank you so much. And thank you, Manfred. We loved having you here. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for engaging and uh, getting all participating. So I really appreciate it. And if you have any questions, um, I can just put my email address. You'll get my email address, actually, 
uh, through the follow-up email. Uh, feel free to email me any questions that you have, and also you'll receive a leadership guide, which kind of can dive in more into your own self-awareness through that guide um, as well. So yeah, look forward to hearing from you as well. Thank you. Bye.